Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number two, seven. Seven, I'm going to say, 277, right? It should be 277. If it's not, I apologize. I always get the numbers wrong. I do so many of these a day. You know how it is. Humble little brag, light flex. But I hope you guys are well. As you're aware, if you're joining this show for the second time or if it's your third, fourth or more time, this is the number one podcast regarding streetwear. And for me, streetwear encompasses everything from art, fashion, uh, trainers, uh, design, music, culture, anything underneath that umbrella I put under the um, bigger umbrella of streetwear. So if you want to find out all that news, all that good stuff, then you're at the right place. I go through some topics that I found during the week. I kind of expand on some issues, touch some stuff that I've seen, you know, in previous weeks that I've kind of saved, I've forgotten about, or just talk about some regular events that happen in my life that I think fall underneath that umbrella. As per usual, if you're watching this for the first time and you want to, you know, give me some love or you want to leave me a comment, fair enough, do that right now. You can also smash that like button at the end of the video if you like what you see. If you want to click the subscribe button, you can also come back and find some more videos of mine at a later date. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, the best thing you can do is leave me a five star review and share this show with all your friends. You know, there's a little button on your phone. You should be able to share a show you listen to via podcast app on all your different social media platforms. Share it. Get it out there. Let people know about the show. And then we can keep on growing. Okay? Cool. Safe. All right. Bless. Anyway, how am I? Doing well, man. I'm on my one meal a day diet at the moment. I've been jumping around on diets if you've been paying attention. I was keto, paleo. Then I was doing the flipping 16-8. But now I'm just going to jump on to doing the M O M A D. But I'm only doing it because I had a bit of a crazy weekend. So I kind of want to detox my body a little bit. I want to get back to some level or some semblance of normality. You know, it's been a bit... You know when you have those... I had I had that kind of... You know when you have that new year where you kind of just keep going? No, you know when you have those holidays where you just keep going? I think this is probably one of my best holidays that I've had with my family in a long time. So because of that, I, can't, I tend to... I, I basically let myself go a bit and I ended up you know, extending my holiday celebrations until the, you know, until the, what, the third week of January or something. So, um, yeah, please excuse my ill discipline because I think that's one of the things that I kind of hold myself to a high standard of. Well, that's something that I kind of think is one of my special skills or gifts that I'm able to kind of, you know, commit full flung into one type of lifestyle or to, you know, throw myself head first into an experiment, especially experiment when it has to do with my lifestyle and has to do with health and has to do with my fitness and just kind of not look back, right? Have my blinkers on and just keep on going. But I guess because I had a, such a good holiday season, such a good Christmas gathering with my family, I kind of just got a bit giddy. You know, I, I, I kind of acted like a bit of a basic B-I-T-C-H, which is not usually me. But, you know, things happen like that. I'm sure you guys are aware of those people who have those birthdays that last for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? Um, I was, I succumbed to it. So I can't, now I can't cuss it, right? I can't sit there and start pointing fingers and start bemoaning or start saying how much, you know, how uh, corny those people are because I've now done it myself because I'd be a hypocrite, wouldn't I? Or I could just do it and never tell anyone that I did this thing that I did right now, right? I could just keep it to myself or, you know, these people are listening right now on the podcast. But yeah, so um, I'm doing a bit of a, oh yeah, so I'm it, right? It's O-M-A-D, one meal a day. I'm picking breakfast for now because breakfast for me usually is my favorite meal of the day. And you and because I uh, usually work out quite early in the in the day too, I usually work out between the hours of five and six a.m. So if I'm working out so early, I need to have I need to replenish my body with something. But when I come back home, I can't necessarily just stay home, chill, and go straight to work and grab a you know a prep a Monday sandwich like everyone else does. I've got to have an actual meal because you know my body's flipping crying out for it. So I guess if I'm gonna work out late, if I'm gonna work out early in the morning, I've got to have a breakfast. And have that small one bit of day. And if I'm going to work out after work, then I've got to have, obviously, lunch or dinner. I've got to pick one or the other. But for me, I would prefer to pick uh, dinner. I would prefer to pick breakfast because I know, you know, when I'm working Monday to Friday, there's no real need for me to snack. I don't really, I don't know. I guess that's what I'm lucky in that, in that regard where I have a sweet tooth. I do, don't get me wrong. If anyone knows me, you'll know that I love a good donut. I love a good proce- bit, of, bit of processed food. I love a bit. I love a croissant, you know, a pack of biscuits, whatever. I'll demolish those. But... For the most part, I don't get drawn. I don't get, you know, licking my lips now because you can tell I haven't eaten. But <laughs> I don't get, um, what do you say? Um, 
I don't get tempted by work snacks. You know, when someone brings in something, oh, hey, guys, I just came back from Marrakesh and I got these sweets from Morocco. Like, doesn't really bother me that much. Or when somebody, you know, just has it's their birthday and they, they get the team gets a cake and there's some leftover. Doesn't really bother me that much either. Um, or when we have like Thursday drinks and, you know, the office manager goes out and gets like a really good full, a, a really good spread. Not, not bothers, doesn't bother me either. If I know what I have to eat during a week, I'll just stick with it because I know what I have to look forward to is the weekends, right? The weekends for me are really sacred. They're the, they're the times where I get to kind of really enjoy myself. I don't necessarily want to like, I don't know, not share my personality, but I don't want to indulge myself during the week because I know I can indulge myself quite easily on the weekend, right? That could be my quote unquote cheat meal or my cheat day because I can literally spend my own money and buy the things that I want to buy, right? Yeah, that's it probably. You know, people are so eager to like eat sugary or chocolatey stuff at work. It's like, don't you have your money to buy your own sugary snacks? But then the, re- the reply would be from people that do do that. You'd be like, oh, why not? It's free, right? I don't have to spend my money. But you are going to spend money anyway. You're going to eat that and then you're going to eat something else that you buy. I don't want to double up on my, you know, on my indulgence. I want to just, you know, buy my own indulgence and kind of be satisfied with that. But again, maybe that's just me. Um, so I'm doing that at the moment, one meal a day. And then also obviously working out in the morning, doing loads of running. I, I ran like four miles this morning. I'm probably going to do three to four uh, 1,000 meter sprints around the little uh, block that I've got in, in in the what quite near to my house, and then yeah, just keep going with that sort of stuff, man. At, at the moment, that's kind of my mo that I'm kind of really kind of focusing on, just making sure that I'm running a lot, doing all my workouts, so that when it comes to race season, I'm doing a little bit of a half a 5k at the end of the month. That I'll, you know, update you guys on later about where I'm doing it and stuff. But when I once I do that, then I know that I'm ready to go for race season because I definitely want to give Hackney Half Marathon another go. Last time around or a few years back, Hackney Half Marathon was a real struggle for me. Maybe it was two years ago because I missed last year. It might have been two years ago, yeah. It was a real struggle for me. As I mentioned previously, it's one of the most difficult five, it's one of the most difficult half marathons I think in the UK, hands down. Um, if you know anything about the Hackney Wick area, that sort of Stratford area where the Hackney Marshes are, you know that there's no high-rise buildings for the most part, apart from the block of flats which the race doesn't go around. Everything is like, I don't know, maximum four stories. So on a hot summer's day when the sun is bearing down and smashing on that on that tarmac, right, it's so swirlingly hot. Like people were fainting left, right and centre when we were running. And um, the, not the kind of people that you would expect to think. You know, there's those people that are like, you know, if they bust their toe, they'll just pretend they, you know, they sprain their ankle or some stuff and to get out of the race. People that actually look like they, they actually run quite regularly were succumbing to the dehydration or to the sun bam, beating down on them. I was quite lucky, I think, because I think I noticed everyone was fainting, so I kept running near the shade. But I think people who ran a bit further in front of the pack who kind of got the full extent of the sun just died on that on that, on that, on that track in it or on that race on that race course. And I don't want to be that person. So fingers crossed I'm able to do that going forward. That's the kind of dream. Um, that's what I want to do. So I want to be prepared to do that. Obviously be prepared to do some other races I want to do. I can't do Berlin Half Marathon now because all the tickets for that are sold out, unfortunately, which is annoying. But again, I shouldn't be surprised. It's one of the most popular half marathons out there, isn't it, really? Um, that sold out flipped pretty quickly, I think, for the most part. Guaranteed entry is gone, I'm pretty sure. Now you have to register via flipping um, tour operator or charity. Yeah, completely sold out, man. Madness, isn't it? They sell out so quickly. It's in April as well, the 5th of April, and it's already gone. But that's no biggie. I'm going to go to Berlin anyway, so no need to kind of cheat on that one. But yeah, that's the basic plan, man. Just keep running, going to the gym a little bit, not banging out the gym too much. I want to really get my running down pat and obviously do a lot of bodyweight exercises too and those kind of wads. They kind of work out really well for me. But for the most part, just concentrate on my running and get that where it needs to be and then kind of pick it up from there. How have you guys been? Good? Good. Great. Amazing. Anyway, let's get on with the show. So much to talk about, so much to get into. And I want to kind of rattle through some topics before we all head off and get on with our lives. So, topic number one I want to talk about before... And why my brush burn my nose before we talk about this? One second. So, uh, topic number one. Over the weekend, I was lucky enough to go and DJ at a very fun house party for a mutual friend uh, called Giuseppe. Um, so, Natalia kind of hooked me up with him. Um, also known as Afro Musa, so um, her alongside her husband, uh, we went down there and kind of set up and sort of like you know made sure that we put on a good night. So I think we played there previously. I think I might mentioned a few times ago before. Like they, um, he lives in a house next to I think I'll say Dawson, not too far from Dawson, kind of like in between Dawson and Hackney Central. So uh, he has these yearly 
birthday bashes or parties in his house that are just incredible. Last one was Halloween. I think before that was something else. And this one's just a new year. I'm not sure if it's his birthday or whatever, but he always has these really cool parties that he puts on, right? And it's always a theme. So you do a different theme. You'll decorate the house. It'll be fancy dress or kind of, you know, had to get dressed up to some extent. And the past couple of I've been to, I didn't really dress up. This time around, I did want to dress up because it was a pajama party. So there was no excuse not to. So I decided to go out to Peacock's, get a little crappy PJ set that I bought for £15. That's probably going to, you know, rip into two ones I throw into the wash. But, you know, say la vie. And then um, the job was then to get some equipment to go down there. And that's part of the issue that I've kind of stumbled upon in terms of DJing wise, right? So something I kind of want to address this year. I don't necessarily have the equipment at the moment to kind of allow me to be the quote unquote mobile DJ or somebody that can kind of set up parties wherever it may be. And sometimes put on parties wherever you want to put them. So the plan at the moment is to get a Pioneer XDJ XZ. I'm pretty sure that, that's what it's called, right? I mentioned it previously already. The Pioneer. I've got a pin here. The Pioneer XDJ. X, is it XDJ XZ or XDJ RZ? Okay, it's the XDJ XZ. I'm pretty. No, or is that the 42 channel? Which one is it? RX2 or XZ? Let's say the RX2. So there's, there's these two. There's three systems at the moment, right? Okay, on the screen, all in one system from Pioneer. And if you know, if you're not familiar, Pioneer is the premier, the kind of industry standard brand for all DJ equipment. Um, if you're playing in clubs or bars around the world, you'll know that most places have you know Pioneer decks, Pioneer, I mean Pioneer decks, Pioneer mixers, or at the very least, Allen and Heath, and maybe some other nondescript brands. For the, for the most part, everyone kind of you know has the industry standards of Pioneers, and you can you know for the most part, there's CDJ players that you can chuck CDs in that you can burn. Or you can more handily use a USB stick that you kind of load all your other songs on this app called Record Box, and then you kind of put your songs into the USB, plug that into the CDJ player, and you can kind of initially manipulate it through the big uh, platters that are on the top, sort of like a MIDI player, basically a MIDI player. Um, and in Pioneer, luckily, over the years, I think because the actual decks themselves, the CDJs, are quite expensive, Pioneer just realized that there was a gap in the market between what I have here, which is a DJ controller, a little tiny one that just plugs into your laptop, and then where something that could kind of allow you to practice on industry standard gear, something you find in a club. So it's got the same sort of slider length, the same uh, size of platter, the mixer's fairly this fairly similar. So they've kind of noticed that gap in the market and they, disc and they kind of make these all-in-one systems that basically work without the use of a laptop. And all you've got a USB stick, that's got memory that's got songs on them that you've kind of already synced up onto record box so you've got quant quantize you kind of load them up into the decks and then boom you're ready to go um and i've wanted one for ages and i think for occasions like this where we kind of played previously this weekend on um in dawson for giuseppe's house party it would be amazing to have like the ability to kind of rock up with a uh, industry standard equipment that you can just plug into a pair of speakers and you're ready to go you don't need to take your laptop with you and all this sort of stuff just a, a nice set of speakers maybe an amp uh, to kind of make sure everything is rolling and then boom you're you're on your way so that's what i kind of want to get going forward and i think this will again will be good for my home studio be amazing for my home studio and also be amazing to allow me to play out in more places especially around stratford there aren't that many bars in stratford that have decks for the most part they might have turntables if that so we try to so i would try to actually get us the opportunity to play in some bars and pubs around Stratford that have don't have the equipment but also have a PA system because a lot of them have because Stratford's old school in that way it reminds me of the, you know back in the day where most part they have a lot of open mic nights so a lot of people go in there with their acoustic guitars and sing or with a little band a little covers band a little tribute band or just you know maybe go out there and do some stand up uh, so for everyone has a everyone usually has like a PA system that you can kind of plug into so you can uh, put the sound through the speakers of the actual bar and pub which is fine so there's some sort of power output but for the most part it's the most basic of it's the most basic of setups a few speakers a few sonuses around the corner around the the, the kind of corners of the room and then the Spotify playing the music which is you know it, I think does a job in Stratford for the most part but now that Stratford is kind of getting a little bit gentrified and there's a whole new energy happening here it would be great to kind of allow it could be great to also kind of uh, take advantage of that and also have the ability to kind of play every week, right? A Friday or a Saturday, because these places, if we're able to play, if we're, if we're, if I'm, if we're able to do what I think we're able to do, I reckon a lot of these bars and pubs want us to come around more often. And again, this is the only, this is kind of the best way I think for me and uh, for me and Natalia and for anybody else to kind of have the opportunity to have like a residency spot, because it's hard to get one in London. 
Like it's hard to get anywhere. It's hard to find a a bar or club that isn't the bars and clubs at like two fifty capacity over that would allow somebody or that not even allow that have the opportunity the space to have reg, new resident DJs in. Most of the places already have their people who they kind of used week in week, month in week in week out, month in month out, and it's a bit hard, it's a bit difficult to kind of go out there and get new DJs. And also, no one wants to take the risk of hiring somebody, and then that guy or girl ends up being completely terrible, right? So they'd rather stick with people that they know, no, no biggie. But it's also hard to get into that the other echelon of DJ clubs, like a place like Phonics or whatever, right? Or like an XOYO or like a I don't know whatever place you're talking about right because they would want a person that's probably a little bit more well known than i am has a bit more clout online maybe has more releases more social media engagement more followers blah 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 but the only way to get to that level is to have a regular spot so you're kind of left in this catch 22 spot so the best way to me to do it get some of these get one of these all-in-one systems some good active monitors or good active speaker sorry maybe an amp if i don't have the active speaker just to kind of control everything in general yeah i think you want one anyway right and then kind of go from there so anyway back to the party so this is the kind of dream i'm going to get i hopefully get the rx2 um very very soon once i save up some money and then you know that'll be the first part of the jigsaw the things i want to do so uh we rocked up there we set up the speakers earlier in the day and then we kind of came everyone we kind of came staggered in with our setup with our dj decks afterwards um i came a bit late because i ended up bloody oversleeping i was incredibly tired this weekend just just due, due to all the running and the working out and the going to work like again i forgot how it was to be like monday to friday properly working somewhere being actually engaged in the work that you're doing and then coming home and doing what i'm doing here podcasting recording a mix editing clip putting stuff online writing blogs reading it's a lot to do right outside of work so i end up being really tired end up oversleeping um so then i end up having to rush get up change quickly put stuff in and just rush over to the house party in my haste i accidentally exploded one of my beer cans i had in my luggage i accidentally exploded it i think putting it into the uh into the little suitcase i got and luckily i caught it before it exploded all over my all over my uh my, my what you call it my midi player but i end up saving that getting to the party on time and then we end up kind of just absolutely destroying it and luckily uh natalia put up a video uh of what actually happened and so okay because i didn't get a chance to record any of it because i was too busy uh trying to make sure everything was synced up right and all my stuff was where it had to be but she put up a really cool kind of post kind of detailing the whole experience here i'll kind of throw it up on here and play some of it for you in the background for you to check out but it's a little post that she put up here um she was the following last saturday was so much fun playing at the blah 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 house for the, 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 the birthday party oh it was a birthday party okay my bad i didn't know these folks love to get down and enjoy loads of styles that we throw at them we transform their kitchen into a boiler room type uh space by bringing two Mackie speakers and our little Serato and Nevotion ne ne itch player to play the Serato Pro Burger do sorry had to be the human laptop standing in transition between me and Agostino uh, controllers paired with Serato Interactor are great for tight spaces uh, sometimes you can't uh, pack in your turntable to CDJs you can explore huge ranges of music to mix quite quickly and take the crowd on an epic journey they are also lighter weight which makes it to put much easier in the Uber and office equ other equipment would love to own a Pioneer X DJ at some point but itch is convenient and super nice piece of hardware so yeah here's a video of what actually happened <laughs> Next video here. You see me in the background, skanking. <laughs> having a good time, having a whale of a time, man. Yeah. Can you feel it? Just the fingers as you guys are on the show. Well, right. Another one. Check it out. I'm the so yeah, fun times all around, man. Absolutely epic, epic, epic occasion. Obviously, there's a time has been holding the laptop like a human uh, laptop holder. But yeah, um, absolute good times, and I really enjoyed it. And again, just so good to, I think, you get to a position like myself where you're playing in local bars and pubs a lot, right? And you're like, oh, it's not, you don't feel like you're stagnating, but it's like, like I mentioned before, it's hard to make that jump from playing in bars and clubs locally and then making a jump to playing in places where there's people that are coming to see DJs, right? Because the place I'm playing in, people are not coming to see DJs. They're coming to have a drink, 
coming to have maybe a burger and a beer, right? They're coming to dance, they're coming to hook up with someone. They're not coming to see me at all, right? They could give a, they could give a, they could give a toss. So to make that jump from where I am to like the next place where people are actually coming to see ADJ, not me specifically, but ADJ, they don't mind, they want to come, come to have a dance. It's really difficult, especially in London, because there's everyone, everyone is a flipping DJ. I'm sure you could throw a flipping stone out the window right now and you hit someone that could, and that could, you know, that could tear down a club. Like, really, legitly, that, that's the issue. Not that everyone's a DJ and they're horrible. Everyone's a DJ and they're bloody awesome. Like, I'm sure we did well there at the house party. And I'm sure people are leaving there thinking, wow, those guys, they're really good, man. Do they play anywhere? It's like, eh, not really. Not anywhere you know. Do you know what I mean? It's all like local places. So the only way to kind of do it is to kind of, uh, the only way to kind of have those kind of fun nights where you get to play in front of a crowd that just wants to hear music and doesn't care about request is to try and do these house parties. But through the house party, you've got no people and blah, blah, blah. It's a whole big thing. So you can feel like you're stagnant. You can feel a bit like dead. And then sometimes, you know, you get a bit new lease of life. You come to, you kind of feel like, oh, wow, this is what I'm in it for. The love of the music, the dancing, the having a good time. And it kind of reminds you of just why DJing and dance music and electronic, uh, this is electronic music in general, just being a fan of it. Forget even us. Just imagine just being, imagine just rocking up to a house party and it being that good, right? There being good drinks in the fridge, good, uh, good people to hang out with, good chat. Do you know what I mean? Like, that, that'll be a dream. Usually when you go to house parties and there's someone DJing, it's usually a couple of dudes or a whole gaggle of friends who don't want to, who are only playing to themselves, right? They're not really playing to a crowd. They're not really trying to make everyone dance. They're just trying to, you know, out, you know, uh, they're just trying to out, let me, what you call it? They're just trying to out, knowledge each other right it, they're, they're all kind of chin strokers trying to show each other how much knowledge they have on music which you know is one thing but to do it in a house party is a whole nother thing but yeah had a good time enjoyed it it was great and i can't wait to do that kind of thing again man like such a good time and again it gives me a, a whole new uh bit of encouragement for my next set that i'm doing on the first of february at the Leighton star so if you're around definitely come down and see me play there Leighton star the first of february i'll put the link down below in the show notes for you guys to check out but yeah that was my dj experience this weekend man pretty cool and then again that that's what probably led to this whole one minute day thing i'm like you know what i need to i need to kind of rein it in a bit um i need to get back to how i was previously before i mentioned it a few times on here the Monday to friday is working and then the odd saturday here and there i'll go out and then that'll be it and i'll spend the, the sunday recovering getting healthy again and then you know what I mean? Like, that's the balance I like a lot. And then sometimes even having just two-week blocks of just doing nothing, just to kind of get the body back into a kind of clean rhythm. Because, again, I think with the DJing thing, just because, you know, you're so, you have so much access to free drinks and to just, you know, debauchery and, you know, other activities, you end up kind of just indulging. So I kind of want to have a bit of balance. But, yeah, that was a good time. I really, really enjoyed myself. So big up everyone that came down. Big up everyone that had a good time. Unfortunately, it had to end early because the police came. But, you know, I don't think that's a good... I, the mark of a good house party is police coming. If they don't come, did you really have a house party though? Know what I mean, so big up that one. Move on. Do, 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 do. Talking about getting healthy and DJing, a very, a very handy article popped up on Mix Mag again. They do some really cool articles on Mix Mag, so big up them. Um, even though I'm a big fan of RA, they've kind of slowed down on the output on their editorials and features. It's kind of they've kind of con- looks like they're concentrating a lot more on quality than quantity. But if you want those short little sound bites or snippets on um, DJ life or like how to you know how to kind of conduct yourself in a rave or whatever maybe or just general health and safety stuff or just general scene stuff and definitely check out mix my do, do some good features. So they've got some a really cool article here that I just stumbled upon today. Uh, with some really cool artwork too that I would love to actually have on a t-shirt which is the following uh, DJ share their tips for going sober in the rave right uh, dance music isn't the easiest environment to be sober in but it's totally possible which is uh, actually true I actually believe that and again I, I think I've had a bit of a, a tough relationship with drinking and going out or especially raves because obviously I've got some I've got some data points in my life right where I've actually done it and it's been perfectly fine like for instance, like when I used to work for Master and I had, you know, a really cool job and I was flying all around the world, meeting all these interesting people, making events, booking people, you know, staying in hotels and stuff. I I uh, specifically did that during the whole, I think the trade show month. So I think that's the beginning of the year. So January when all the streetwear trade show happens in, I think, bread and butter in Berlin. Or I forgot the other one. I think it's called trade. I forgot what it's called. There's a, there's a trade show that happens in Berlin. Uh, they used to have it around the corner from Club Division. I'm not sure if it's still there at the moment, but if you know, you know, right? So 
I'd go there, meet all my quote unquote clients and stuff, and you know, hook, uh, still deal, do the whole business, business partnership stuff, influencer management, you know, the whole shebang, all that cool guy job stuff. So that was great, and I did it during. I did it firstly. I did it my, number one. I did it during sober October, right? And I completed like no problem. So I went to all the all the parties. I went to all the exhibitions, all the free, all the activations, all the free drink activations, and had no issue. And then price, and then uh, the one I remember the most was we went to this um, Adidas Kano thing. Kano, I think, was putting out an album or mix. I don't know what it was, and he was doing a thing with Adidas, and uh, he performed at this look that was kind of like underground place somewhere in Berlin. And they effectively had a whole fridge of fridges of Carlsberg that you could just open up and grab a drink at. And they were kind of replenishing it all the way through the evening. So they had these massive fridges. And then the opposite side, if you turn it back around, there was a bar that you could order a drink at, right? They had like a set menu you could order from. And I had no issue. Raving, having a good time. I, stayed, I was probably one of the last to go home. No issue whatsoever. I was perfectly fine. But then I guess over time, you kind of, you know, you get a little bit like a daisy coil and you kind of fall off the wagon. And I've been in an issue where sometimes I'll go out with the intention of, of being sober raving. But then, of course, I think I'm better at sober raving now because I don't pre-drink as much. I think back in the days I pre-drink a lot. And by the time I'm going out, I'm absolutely slaughtered. So now I don't pre-drink as much. But I'll go out with the intention of not drinking. And you go out and you're just like, you know what, fucking let me have one. Um, I find it easy to do when I'm, not, when I'm DJing because I tend to like not even have... I don't even want to have a drop of alcohol before I DJ. I just want to be completely in tune with what's going on in my surroundings. And just, like kind of... Uh, feel the crowd, feel the vibe, understand what I can and can't play. And I think you're more attuned to that if you're sober. I think so, in my opinion, personally, right? I think the same way how if you were working me at a bar in a nightclub, you'd understand a lot more if if said guy or girl was being an absolute douchebag if you were sober as opposed to drunk. Because when you're drunk, everyone's funny, you know, everyone's humorous, um, everyone's got something interesting about them. I don't know, there is that kind of thing. But when you're sober, you can just be like, oh, who the hell is this guy? It's it? creeper. So that was kind of my um, MO. So now I'm in a place where I'm kind of zen, right? Focused. And um, I want to get back into that kind of lane. So this uh, article kind of uh, touches home for me, touches base for me, or touches base for me. It makes me feel good. I don't know whatever it may be called. So here's the following. Um, it goes on here. It's by a person called uh, Scarlett O'Malley. So definitely check it out. 22nd of January 2020. I'll, check, I'll put in the show if you guys have to read anyway, but I'll quickly read it out here. Ba, 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 ba. So it says the following here. Uh, new Year's Eve is often treated like a final night of debauchery before New Year, New Year, New Me. You know, hit the gym, pick up a hobby, quit social media, ha, and drink alcohol, slash, and drink slash alcohol less or not at all. It's a good chance to breathe health back into focus. As well as a now ubiquitous uh, dry January, during which the sesh is briefly put on hold, more and more people are choosing to go totally sober. Recent YouGov survey showed that 33% of respondents said that they don't ever drink alcohol compared to 24% last year. Okay, so it's rising year by year, which is great to see. I think partly I'd, I'd say because, especially the UK, I'd say because we're such lager louts, because we don't know how to handle our drinks, and because for the most part, We've kind of been steered in this direction because of, you know, the unhealthy or the un, you know, there's a real lack of relationship between going out culture and the government. They don't tend to like understand what we're about or why we kind of do it and why it's important. So we've got these weird draconian laws that essentially, you know, restrict pubs from opening late at night. So people are then going to pubs early in the day, but then trying to smash more drinks in that open the window. And then it affects clubs the same way. Then they've got really tight laws around drugs and no rule um and no rule of um, harm reductions, more so just prevention and just you know outlawing in general. So we're in this weird position where essentially we do so much, especially people that live in really small towns outside of London. Every, anyone I've met that lives in a real small that's grown up in a small town that came to London after after the fact or later on in life, they all had a drop of alcohol. They all had, they all drank way before I did like early. They drank early, really, really early. Um, and effectively that hasn't been a, some, for some people it's been a good thing because, you know, it showed them the way really early. Like, Oh, I don't want to do this when, when I'm getting older. But some people, it turned them into, you know, functioning alcoholics, which, you know, isn't the way to go. So maybe in some regards, because of such lager louts, we get to get all our drinking into, we tend to pack it into one real small chunk of time and then we can kind of really figure out quickly then whether or not we want to do it or not you know what i mean uh but what's it like going sober and navigating the rave while your mates are on it uh we talked to uh, we asked a bunch of djs and others for their advice because after your mind and body isn't 
if after after all your mind and body isn't just for January. Totally agree with that. Look after yourself during the week and weekends will sort themselves out, which I like the idea, right? Uh, before you even hit the rave on Saturday night, what are you doing during the week? A lot of how you're going to be able to handle a 6 a.m. is by being kind to yourself Monday to Friday, which again ties a lot into like healthy diets, right? Some people get hung up on, oh, I'm eating this really shitty thing on a Saturday, but it's not really about what you do on a Saturday. It's definitely what you do Monday to Friday, like consistently. If you're consistently eating good food, staying away from the processed, processed stuff, you'll be te- you tend to... The odd cheat meal here and there won't really hurt you. But the fact that I think the reason why most people are most, you know, uh, P, what, what do you call them, PTs, professional trainers, will tell you not to do cheat meals or not to do cheat days is because they want you to kind of commit to the idea of just generally eating healthy all the way around, like all week round or all month round, as opposed to having this one day to look forward to that then turns into a Sunday to a Monday and all of a sudden you're like, oh, panicking. So I guess raving or session will be this good same sort of thing, right? As long as you stay relatively clean Monday to Friday or pr- predominantly clean Monday to Friday, then you can allow yourself to indulge in a kind of a drink here and there on a, fr- on a, on a Saturday, whatever it may be called, right? Uh, Joe Smith, uh, Secret Sunday's co-founder and DJ said, it's about paying attention to everything else you do in your life, not just on the night that you, do, you go out. If you get yourself into a positive cycle of behavior, like exercising and eating well, then you feel energized when you have to go to clubs. I think that we can really help if you feel benefits when I get to club. Yeah, so I think that can really help uh, you feel the benefits. And when I get to a club at 11 o'clock, I actually feel like I've got a lot of energy, which I definitely agree with. I feel the times where I was relatively sober and I was kind of a bit more militant with my lifestyle, with my fitness and with my health. When I went to the club to DJ, I went to a club to dance or whatever it may be called, I definitely felt a lot more pep in my step than I would have done like sessioning it up before I go to the rave. I think usually in my experience, I would also say if you're going to go see a DJ that you actually like um, uh, and you're not going just for kind of night out to go get plastered, you actually want to go see someone play or you're going to go see a a label night or you're just intrigued to kind of stand by the booth and just watch how they mix or how they can put themselves together. I would say it'd be quite beneficial to actually go there sober, fill the place out, catch a vibe, get yourself acquainted with the atmosphere for an hour or two, right? And then get your first drink. That's what I would do, personally. I think that's a great way to go about it. The fact that you go in there straight away and get completely on it, I don't think that's the way to go about it. And if you know, if you notice, people that go out in Berlin, especially the people that go to like the big mega clubs or ones that go out every single night, for the most part, they don't get on it as much as we do. And if they do, they do it sober, which is very peculiar. You know, it's a proper psychopath thing to do and to get on it sober. But for the most part, they do that. And I guess most of the reason why is so that you can last longer during the night. And if you're lasting longer, that means you're more cognitive of your surroundings. You can remember more stuff because, you know, the lo- the, the thing that's dread- the thing that I hate most is going out to a, a night out or going out on a night out, especially to go see a big DJ or to go see, you know, to go to a really cool club or a, sh- a label showcase, whatever it may be. And you're going and when you come back home, you don't remember anything. You don't remember a set or anything. Because in my experience, of, in my case, I tend to not use my phone on the dance floor. I just don't record anything um i don't have anything any memory any idea of what actually happened i have to kind of piece together later on that later on in the morning and that's not something that you want to do really going forward um he continues here remind yourself that it's actually about all about the music which i mentioned earlier and ignore the peer pressure the reason you're going out is because uh, the reason you're going out is because there is music playing the reason you've cut short a saturday of netflix binging is to see a dj and hit the rave so remind yourself that this is the motive 100 percent agree with that dj fat tony road to sobriety has been well documented i'll definitely check out i, def- I think he's got a documentary out on bbc definitely check it out it's really informative um he's a he's a bit of a weapon don't get me wrong he comes across like a bit of a weapon but he just it's that old school soho kind of like you know socialite kind of thing but definitely check it put put your personal feelings about him to one side it's definitely a really informative uh, documentary yeah he recently marks 13 years sober which you know uh, much respect to him being involved in fashion um being involved in music and being 13 years sober is just incredible uh and said that going clean was not a decision but a life or death situation he advises to not give up not give it to peer pressure which is something that uh, so many of us have to deal with so keep the right friends around you when you so when you go sober raving feeling like you're the only reason for not going feeling like the only reason to go out is to get fucked up uh, can be problematic fat tony said take it back to basics and there can be uh, uh, take it back to basics and be there to enjoy the greatest drugs of all music everything else secondary i definitely agree that i think once you get involved in electronic music or you get involved in a scene it's not really about the drugs or drinking. I think in the beginning it might be, especially if you're doing it, especially if you, I think for most, some people, there might be the, 
there might be this like kind of uh nostalgia around going out and getting on it because maybe the you maybe the first event you were let out to go to or to kind of attend especially when you were young was a festival your parents might have been more allowing you more uh, willing to let you go to a festival with your friends and go camping because they knew there's a whole group of you that let you go to a nightclub so there might be an association with that with it but i think in general once you get involved in the scene and once you start buying records you start going to clubs you start attending festivals you start going to follow djs around you start buying merch it's less about the drugs and the alcohol it's all about the actual being involved in the scene being part of a little community meeting people seeing the same faces again like hey what's up man in the smoking area do you know what i mean that little that friendship that you make in smoking areas the friends that you make in the, in the toilet queue like all that is the more fun than the actual thing that you're going to go do i would say so have it in moderation but again it's hard to do once you kind of get involved in it. you're trying to use it a bit of a crutch especially socially like oh you know i'm gonna have fun if i get on it but it's like no not really man sometimes the best times i've had especially when i went to primavera as a good example you know you're spending 10 hours a day outside you can't be on it all the time most of the reason why you're having fun is because you're in this great city that you're only exploring because you come to a festival and the festival you're going to see this dj and you're going to go see this band and you might bump into somebody that you bumped that you uh bumped into when you went to go see the band play in a small gig somewhere in the middle of king's cross that is a whole f- that's what really gets you out of bed uh as opposed to the idea of just going out and getting on it all the time because that's you know you might as well just do that at home innit, if you're going to do that and just save loads of money uh let's go continue on uh dj producer will clark has released tunes through abode relief and drum code and uh true soul and is currently gigging the u.s will has been sober for eight years but has never had never been a massive drinker which is obviously does help i think sometimes if you're if you're a big drinker and you like to get on it that's when you've got an issue i think if one or the other you're not that keen on especially if one or the other came later in life it's a bit easier to give up on but i think if you've got the double the double uh the double whammy it's gonna be a long long road for you so the following anyway um for dj is going sober he said have some friends around that really respect you and who you can have fun with regardless maybe that's just a tour manager or whoever but for the first six months of playing shows is probably going to be tough especially if you are uh, use alcohol to relax yourself again that's very very true i would have to disagree with that a little bit i'm a real i'm a real big stickler for self-control i think people should be able to have a bit of self-control i think the idea that you should imagine i remember there was one time i used to work at this place right and um there was a group of people in the office who were complaining that they would get that they were basically complaining that there were too many fatty snacks in the, in the kind of kitchen we were buying too many uh processed food too many uh sugary treats so and they were getting um they were feeling self-conscious because they they were kind of they were had that they had the assumption that all these sugary treats in the office were contributing to their weight or contributing to the way they were looking or they're contributing to their health which is you know absurd really isn't it um so then the office decided to go okay we're going to change it we're going to bring in all these healthy snacks and everyone that didn't want the healthy snacks complained and the people that were complaining about the, the, the sugary treats just would go out on their lunch and buy loads of shit anyway and eat it in secret or whatever you know what i mean or have bags or have bags in their bags and be opening them under their desk as they make as they're working so i think there should be this there, there should be a point in life especially as a grown-up where you're able to have a bit of self-control and if the, your office is littered, littered with flipping kinder buenos or snicker bars if you're not meant to be if you're not meant to be eating chocolate on a week don't eat the chocolate bar in a week it's easy the most office most offices have the option of a snickers bar or jar and also a jar that's full of peanuts grab the peanuts or don't grab anything at all it's easy to do and i think the idea that um you should have your friends you should only have friends that are also sober to go raving with is a little bit short-sighted because i think the moment you have one friend who kind of uh, you know you know says oh do you want a bump it's going to automatically break your will but if you're able to surround yourself with people who are getting on it or getting drunk and you're able to kind of just you know you can move you can't you don't have to stand around your friends holding their hand right like with your finger in their belt loop if they get a bit too wasted you can just move around and go to another group yeah it's not hard to do like we all we've all made flipping friends on a dance floor that we you know wanted to start businesses with right under the influence so i'm sure you'll be able to find somebody who doesn't mind you know sharing the old banter here and there having a bit of a dance a little bit of a high five a little bit of a hug and keep it moving it's not hard to do so i think i don't know i wouldn't necessarily say just change all your friends i say maybe try and go out on your own sober that might help just to kind of get you used to being around the people who are drunk again and getting messed up and then maybe through there you might bump into somebody that you know just will have to go out on their own sober anyway regardless then suddenly you've got two people but to say that you have to suddenly find friends who are sober just to go out is a little bit weird 
it continues here uh paris based dj louisa one of my favorites um, i found it really helpful to be aware of what I, what my purpose is going at she said if it's to live vicariously through people who are effed up or to mourn the fact that i've lost the ability to drink and use safely i should probably sit that sit that night out if my goal is to going to spend uh spread joy to connect and be of and be of service to celebrate being alive i can safely go anywhere in the world which i love that's the sentence i love the most right i should probably say yeah, yeah if my goal is to go it's a it's going out spread joy to connect and to be of service and to celebrate being alive i can safely go anywhere in the world that's definitely for me that's 100 percent my kind of mo but i guess everyone's different not everyone can go out on their own and have fun but i bloody love it another one stay hydrated promoter um kai can't the brains behind a bone has said has been sober for the past uh for, for the best part of a year and he says that he can't see himself going back he believes that hydration is the key to feeling good imagine what those boys at a bone must be like man so big up him man a bone is that that's Kana's associate that's Kana's direct isn't it Kana's world cup over there isn't it so if you're sober there it must be amazing um he believes that hydration is the key um i've been trying to go sober for the last three years he says but i found it hard at three nights a week i'd be at my events but i actually cracked it this year hydrate your body immensely more well, massively don't eat any junk food and try and eat a healthy meal before you get to the club and take some energy bars with you or cocoa bars which i definitely agree with. i think the idea of hydration obviously is may maybe getting you more full up or making sure that you have liquids inside you and then the idea of avoiding junk food is that I, I guess if you're eating processed food or junk food there's a lot of salt there and that would obviously make you want to crave beer or whatever it may be. And that's not necessarily conducive to it. And sometimes it just might make you lethargic. So the idea to kind of go in there eating a relatively clean diet, maybe plant-based, maybe more paleo-based, having some good healthy fats in you, some a good amount of water, will necessarily, won't necessarily make you want to kind of go out and get a drink really. You're just, you're quite full. There's no real need to do that. You're cognitively aware. And once you kind of pass that one, two, three, four hour in the, in the evening, especially if you're setting up, especially if it's part of the crew or a boat, you're kind of already on the home stretch and no need to get a drink then at that time. Uh, some bouncers might give you an odd look uh, when you turn up with a pocket full of energy bars which I love the idea of that actually going in there with some energy bars or some or some cereal bars whatever it may be called uh, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do there's also a growing number of alcohol free alternatives that are tasty and help you blend it better with the plastic pint glass of water oh yeah I think that's uh, who's got the good one Cosmo's got a really good one I heard and they also cost a company in um, bloody hell what's a, what's a beer that a Post Malone drinks all the time Bumba. I forgot the beer of it is. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, let's continue. Uh, disco Funk DJ and co-founder of London Disco Society, Rory Cords, believes that alcohol alcoholic beer or non-alcoholic beer is way forward. Rory, who's been sober since May 2019, said, there's a weird thing that happens when you're drinking alcohol-free beer. You feel part of the pack, which is true, because at least you've got the bottle or you can put it in a cup and it looks like alcoholic beer and it maybe has that same sort of bubbly effect in you, you know what I mean I don't know it just makes you probably feel um, again it probably takes because I guess that's part of the reason why people don't like being sober in parties or raves or pubs around their friends it's that whole social peer pressure thing where someone's getting around they're like oh do you want a drink you're like no nah. like, come on get a drink get a drink it's just annoying so the fact that you can get a drink for yourself that looks like a beer and just have that sit on your table and sip it you know like you know sip it slowly it kind of avoids all that kind of friction um she says the following continue on you'll find beer and gin alternatives being stocked at increasing number of venues and sober events are moving into mainstream clubs such as fat tony's no booze launching in march which is great to see here uh try not to get wound up by the intoxicated people um there's nothing like waking up the next morning and remembering or or, or, high, or hardly remembering chewing off someone with mace ear in the smoking area uh spirit spirit land resident jazz fm presenter and frankenstein hasn't ever really drunk alcohol but as a working dj she's experienced every drunk person in the room she said drunk people can be irritating of course we all know that being a dj myself i definitely understand that especially when you're not drinking don't get too wound up by them and don't take their request too seriously sometimes my heart bleeds for somebody when they really 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 want to hear a song but but and if i can i'll do it it's important to not take them too seriously i definitely agree with that um i've had people who have who have who have want to stand there and watch the dj watch me dj the best thing you can get out of a drunk people at the club is to be amused by them I definitely agree with that i think the people that are too annoyed by drunk people and get all hot and bothered by it you know why do you neck it you know what i mean it's a party it's revenue in the day not everyone is coming there to like you know hear your latest release some people are just going there just to kind of get smashed and you know slip on the floor spark their head on the ground and you know wake up in someone's lap that's what they want and some people are there for the music just treat them as you know as the kind of amusement as they are 
And uh, I think I've, I've found that the more you do that, the more likely they are to kind of leave you alone, really, by the most because they realize quite quickly, oh shit, this person thinks I'm a joke, and then they get super self conscious. And I've done it myself. I'll get you get super self conscious. You start looking into yourself, start thinking, oh my god, I'm such an embarrassment. Your DJ thinks I'm a loser, and then you just run away. And then you know, win win. You run away. You're not you're not embarrassing yourself, and then I have you uh, spit all over their decks or their face. Continues on. Um, however, she was, uh, she also has some wise words for those not participating in Dry January or who aren't full time sober. She said, "Don't just latch onto the DJ because you're bored. If you're taking MDMA and you feel some kind of spiritual connection with the DJ, understand it's probably not mutual. <laughs> feel the love from the distance. I never agree with that. <laughs> oh, then no, it's a good one here. And then stay out of the green room. Possibly the wisest tip in the list of DJs who have gone sober: don't go in the green room." The green room is the illustrious place where anything can happen and all sorts goes on behind closed doors. Some of the best things happen in the green room, but you know these places can be a lawless land. Kai from Abode said that for DJs, my advice would be don't go to the club three hours before you're set. Treat it as a job. Try and stay out of the green rooms where everything goes on. Definitely agree with that. I think, again, it's different for me. I play in bars and clubs, so it's I try to go in a bit earlier so I can just like catch the vibe of the room just so I can see what's kind of going on and hear what they're playing from Spotify because sometimes you might go to a bar or a pub where they've, they've got a banging playlist on and you don't want to just play the same tracks that you, they've got on their playlist on you know, from your USB. So I just want to avoid that, just kind of keep it abreast of the situation, blah, blah, blah. But I can imagine what it must be like being a DJ DJ and playing at a, a proper club, like turning up to fold two hours before your set might not be the most wisest decision for your nostrils, right? You might need to kind of maybe turn up there an hour or half an hour before you're set just so you can kind of get acquainted with the area, meet the owner, shake hands, put your stuff behind the booth and then kind of get ready to go on. Um, and again, I'm, I'm a real big believer. I think I've learned this from the comic, from the stand-up comedy scene. You should really only partake in anything after your set is done or maybe after you've seen your DJ, right? I think if you're a dunk, if you're someone that's going to go, get on it when you're going out, it might be a good opportunity to kind of see your DJ play first, see the person that you want to go see the artist the live act and then after the fact maybe during the peak hours when they finish or maybe as yeah just about to finish maybe then start to intake uh start to indulge yourself so that you can remember the occasion and kind of savor the whole moment the whole moment i would say again uh just from the outside looking in um Josh from Seeker Sunday says, I've been, a, I've been a hedonistic person for quite a large period of my life. I spent a lot of time in clubs and that's a difficulty if you're a DJ. You do have a choice to play your set and go, but there are pressures to get involved and have fun and hang out and whatnot. But as someone running a club night and being a touring and touching DJ, I definitely agree with him. It's, it is hard. DJing is a passion thing. You do it because you love it, but it's a social environment and, and work as well. If you have to do in and out job, don't feel bad. You need to prioritize yourself first. 100% agree with that. Here, so here as well, another really good tip plan a swift getaway there is um there is that one there this is one that many people who drink may have not thought of but when speaking to a different dj quite a few of them suggested that if you're going to go sober figure out your way to your get out your your own getaway plans um that's probably the french exit in it just kind of duck out will clark says i like to always drive to a show if i'm going out purely because it uh, means I can leave when I want. And also you've got, you got the excuse that, oh, I can't drink, I'm driving. I love that, right? Uh, then comes a point when everyone starts to get a little too messy and you can, can, you can leave and get home pretty quickly. Louisa had the same sentiment and said, I found that my attention span is much shorter in sobriety and it's best if I have my own means of getting home from the rave, unless I'm the designated driver. And it can get, and it can be great to have a sober wingman or woman so I don't feel left out or overwhelmed while everyone is peaking. It's not to suggest that you will want to leave early, but there's nothing wrong with a sick exit. And again, stay strong. But yeah, so a really good article. I recommend you check it out. I'll put it in the show notes for you guys to list, to read, and to kind of divulge. But definitely a good one and definitely one of my favorites and definitely ties into what I'm kind of doing now at the moment. So definitely check it out. Right? Boop, boop, boop. Let's move on quickly. Let's go to the next one. Oh, this is another, just to touch, just to touch on a, again for sobriety's sake. This is one about diets. This is from a while back on Mixed Mag, right? Um, it says the following. Um, this artist called B Traits, who I'm not too familiar with, I've got to be completely honest, on how her paleo diet keeps her fit on tour and in the studio. So I guess, again, this is kind of going back to, I guess in general, this will kind of be helpful with electronic music booming. I guess there's so many festivals happening at the moment. Every kind of popular artist out at the moment, especially in hip-hop, has their own fest. Um, most club nights in London or in the UK have their own little festival that they do in conjunction with maybe other club nights, other festivals, other label heads, other you know investors. 
everyone's kind of doing something for this festival season and that means electronic music is getting more popular you don't really notice it because there's not many there's not new there's not a lot of new clubs opening but there is this constant there is a constant de- uh, deluge of like bookings and people coming to play out e1 and print works and fold and corsica studios and all these and you know pickle factory and oval space there's they're always booked right there's people playing all the time so um there is this idea that maybe there needs to be a, a also a kind of an upgrade in how punters go out and how they conduct themselves because i know for me and i've been in a situation where i've been a flipping disgrace so i've been the liability to myself or my friends but then over time but with experience and probably making probably making tons of mistakes you start to realize how to conduct yourself and how to kind of really be an asset to the community an asset to the scene uh, a good contribution of uh, uh, a good time to be around it's really important i recognize as well especially if you go to these places a lot you don't want people to kind of roll their eyes and be like, oh no, here's, here's come this guy again with his nonsense. You don't want people to kind of, you know, smile when they see you come through the door. I would expect so. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking out my ass, but I think that's a good part of it. Again, part of it would be how you connect yourself outside of electronic music. Because I think for the most part, if you're an electronic music fan, you're not really wasting your time going to random bars and clubs to hear random DJs, right? You're going to go see play. You're going to go to nightclub to go support your favorite actor, your favorite artist, right? So you don't necessarily need to indulge in going out all the time during the week you can kind of you know spec out your big nights out you know end of the month festival season so there is this idea that you should probably have a balanced way of living outside of a nightclub just so it can allow you the platform or the opportunity to kind of go a bit crazy on the weekends i would think so anyway i don't know maybe it's just me so this article continues right on her paleo diet that keeps her fitting in the studio um so the following um also referred to as a kind of caveman diet uh and being paleo consists of only eating foods consumed by primitive uh, paleolithic humans and cutting out processed fare or processed fare such as grains and lentils adopting a diet closely aligned with the limitations has had a life-changing impact on b traits she says the following it completely changed the way that my body was able to burn energy so i could have absolutely almost zero sleep and still run at full brain capacity and not get tired uh which was amazing for me and again i think if you're a big dj or if you're a dj even just playing live sets or late sets if you're like solomon or something you have to have something like this in your kind of arsenal there's no way you can kind of just go about you know drinking i don't know there are some people that exist like that right i guess um ozzy osborne's a good one lemmy was maybe a good one as well but they're they're kind of um, outliers who are able to kind of you know there are you know, I'm sure if you spoke to Steven Tyler, he had loads of, he had, you know, he's one person who kind of, you know, didn't succumb to drugs and alcohol and essentially was able to kind of kick it and become sober. But he's probably, he could probably name you loads of his friends, loads of these kind of peers who, you know, fell by the wayside due to their kind of inability to kind of have some kind of balance in life. So I guess most of us can't say we have the talent or the gene that enables us to go out and get hammered all the time. So we have to have a bit of balance. And I guess this is kind of the best way to do it. Allow yourself to have a diet, maybe like mine, like keto, that's probably um, high in fats that allows you to kind of burn those fats, especially if you're going to DJ late at night. That would be quite cool. Uh, maybe having, you know, bl- some blue, what, what are those things called? Um, blackout blinds and stuff when you are sleeping, so you're out, out. All those things can kind of help. Anyway, continues. Let's go on. Um, no longer struggling with the ability to health issues, b career has given the strength to flourish. Whether it's on the road, in the studio, or in the Radio 1, where she holds an esteemed Friday night residency, it makes me stronger as a human, being able to tackle things on a daily basis better. Um, if she slips up, the effects tell. Sometimes I'll be feeling pretty good, and I'll think, I could eat a bowl of pasta. Then the next day, the way my, that my body feels and reacts, it's like having a hangover from grain. I feel slightly, really sluggish, and like I've had a p- bunch of alcohol. It's really strange. Of course, that's what happens. And once your body gets used to eating a certain way, and then you suddenly revert, back to how you were previously it just reacts completely different it's like when i stop eating sugar or i stop having chocolates and stuff right suddenly your mouth becomes like you have this kind of gammy mouth for a while then it kind of runs out maybe over a week you, you kind of go back to normal but then or maybe yeah after maybe step maybe 13 days you go back to you start to come you get acclimatized to that kind of feeling of not having a chocolate bar ever in your mouth right but then once you get back on it, once you start, once you kind of bite into a Kit Kat, it, your mouth explodes. Like, whoa, I didn't know this stuff tasted so sugary and chemically, right? Because you're so used to eating every day, um, which makes complete sense, right? Uh, at the same time, finding a balance is important, she says. 
and she's able to loosen up while on tour every now and then adding that as well as having a strict diet i do believe in li in living life and enjoying it so i fancy a drink then i'm not going to beat myself up about it usually one glass of patron on the rocks with a fresh lime is enough to again that's amazing so the fact that you're able to balance yourself so much and give yourself so many boundaries and so many kind of constraints in terms of your regular everyday life it then allows you the odd time if you imagine if you're b traits and you just had an amazing ep come out you're playing at your your dream festival in front of a sold out crowd right there might be an occasion where you, and you've got your friends next to you in the dj booth no randoms right you're just feeling good relationships in a good place you're looking fly you're feeling yourself it might be a good occasion to kind of you know let's spark let's spark up a little something let's pour us a little drink let's toast this good occasion because sometimes in life you need to kind of recognize those moments but it only it's only uh, valuable or it's only desirable it's only something that you're going to be you're going to kind of relish or enjoy because you've allowed you kind of uh gave yourself a lot of constraints previously right it's that kind of common energy i kind of go back to all the time discipline equals freedom right that's from joko wilnick uh discipline equals freedom without discipline you don't you're not going to enjoy the fact that you're going on holiday right if you're able to have a balanced diet and suddenly you're going to go to flipping greece or you're going to go to barcelona you're going to enjoy yourself a little bit more because you haven't been eating that kind of food back home but if you indulge yourself in all the confectionaries, all the breads, all the carbohydrates, all the pasta, all the nonsense stuff that we have here, you're not really then going to enjoy the stuff when you go. But of course, you're going to enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. But you're not going to savor it as much as you would have having had some kind of balance. And I definitely agree. That. I think there's some people that just agree just indulging. Life is short. I'm just going to eat what I want to eat. But I think especially in the dance music scene or in the scene in general, I think especially if you're spending loads of time outside, loads of time in the dark, you know in unsociable hours you definitely owe it to yourself to be cognitive of your surroundings especially if you're a woman i would say for the most part you definitely owe it to yourself to be somewhat put together um going out in the night time uh the, the, she says the following beyond watching the egg diet exercise meditation is integral focus and celebrates in com uh, sorry in combating the the toll of touring which has caused beatrice to suffer from anxiety at times and um, it feels weird to even talk about this thing because most people would be like, oh, you have a fucking dream job. You get to travel around and play music to people. But it can be really, really lonely. Of course, I understand that. If you're traveling by yourself, she says, uh, when you're in the perpetual state of party mode, which is what a lot of DJs are in, it can be difficult to take a break for a moment and just let your mind rest. As soon as I start feeling anxious, meditation is the first thing that I try because it can calm me down really fast. She continues adding that hotel room yoga sessions and 40-minute disco naps are also necessary to resting her mind. Having these short breaks through the day is crucial in making her life as a touring dj sustainable since as beatrice tells us you can't always be strict with what time you're going to bed 100 agree so that's true so then again i think all those things are awesome because what it does reduce anxiety i'd imagine because if you don't know what time you're going to leave the club right but then you've got all these other things that you've done really well outside of going out you're not going to be so anxious if like the bar manager or the agent or the promoter is kind of pulling you back to hang around more to chill out you're not going to be that oh we'd go home no you break because you've done everything else outside of it you know you've kind of set yourself up right you've got your you've got your bed nice and warm you've got your pjs on the side you've got a nice glass of i don't know uh tea with some honey in it waiting for you in your hotel room you know everything is set up for you when you walk in so there's no need to kind of be anxious and kind of run away you just need to kind of, you know, let the guy kind of do his thing, pretend you're going to stay, and then when he turns his back, whoop, French exit, all right? So that's a really cool ex that's a really cool advice, I think, from b Trace. And again, I'll, I'll link it in the show if you guys can see, but definitely some sound advice from b Trace and something I've definitely been thinking about or I'm definitely going to be thinking about and implementing in my life, and I hope for other people in the scene, other punters, other dancers, other um, artists, you'd also take notice. So let's continue on here. What's is next? Da, 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 da. Oh, this is a really cool one. Daniel Wang talks about how to get um oh, about uh calling what to do. No, what did Daniel Wang say with the headline? Uh Daniel Disco Professor Daniel Wang digs into the infinite past to inform the present of, of DJ culture. He says the byline is if you're just mixing tracks mindlessly, you might as well just be a spot by playlist. Definitely agree with that one. And that's something I've kind of wondered a lot, especially in some bars and pubs I've played in where, you know. There's no need for, I guess, in some regard, some bars and pubs, especially their bar managers, because they rotate quite often. There may be, how can I say this? Good. Yeah, there may be a need, right? There's maybe a need if you're a bar manager, similar to maybe if you're like a studio executive, which is kind of a weird example to make. But there is this idea when you're a studio executive, right? Or if you're like a person that's trying to write a TV show, 
for a studio or for a network. If a new if a new uh, executive comes in and replaces the one that you were working under, there is the there is the there is the understanding that most likely your career is going to get cancelled because that person coming in doesn't want to just take on doesn't want to doesn't want to carry on the work of their previous uh, person that was in the role. They want to make their own mark and have their own people come in, right? Because you don't get glory that way, just carrying on the work. You know, it's a weird backward method in Hollywood. I don't really agree with it, but that's how Hollywood works. So I'd imagine maybe in a bar circuit, it might be similar where if you're a bar manager, you might want to come in and kind of stamp your own authority on the place and kind of, you know, take out the old DJs, bring your own ones in. So people, and then so then if your night, if the night that you hire the DJ for ends up picking up and making the most money, you can then use that as a bargaining chip for, you know, negotiating the next contract or, may, or moving you up the chain, uh, you know, of the organization. Maybe, I don't know. It's because I've always wondered, sometimes you go to a bar and it's like, why, do, why am I even here? Especially a pub to a place, it's like, they could be they could be uh they'll be well well served just having somebody create a really amazing playlist for them like weekly or something or monthly and then play that in the pub that would do much better than me they don't really need me to stand here awkwardly where there's like no one in front of me everyone's sitting down looking into the walls and just awkwardly playing music and trying to pretend like you're having fun i don't know so that probably is something i've kind of really um come to grips with over the years but this is a really cool article from electronic beats electronic beats sorry um it's a berlin-based publication they usually put some really cool articles on there especially because you know there's, they've got a whole dearth of berlin djs berlin based DJs they can kind of speak to they've got a really cool podcast too that's mostly german speaking but they did have a recent episode with dixon they should definitely check out that was in that was in english that was really illuminating and really informative so if you're a fan of Intervision, check that out and of course daniel wang is like amazing he's written amazing essays on uh, club culture i think i remember he wrote one a really cool one about um oh what's the night that I bloody that, that I went to in Berlin, bloody hell what's it called? Flip I forgot the name. It's it was hosting Greece Milan mostly. I forgot the name of it. But anyway, um, Danny Wang's always got some really cool articles. You write so definitely check out some of his writings from um from previous years. I think he's might got some articles on Extra Beats too that maybe published in the past. But definitely check those out. There anyway, so is the following. Let's go for the article from Daniel Wang. There he is, the Disco Don. Uh, it says the following here. Uh, there may be several reasons why Daniel Wang has been labelled a disco professor over the course of his career. His academic education being one of the them, his treasure of knowledge when it comes to musical history and his theory of being another. The critical thoughts he added as linear notes of some of his releases and the unfolding impression of him as Disco's elder statement at the age of 50 might play their fair share in it too. He looks amazing at 50, isn't it? Jesus Christ. The California by way of Taiwan native spent his uh, student years in Chicago and New York delving into the vibrant Afro-American club scene outside of the lecture hall. Since 2003, he's lived in Berlin as a critical observer of and contributor to the city's club scene and all the while maintaining his international reputation as one of the most educated flamboyant figures of the game. For 25 plus years now, like that's, that, that's, 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 the, that's the kind of level I want to get to. Imagine how good of a DJ I'll be at 50. Woohoo! Uh, he stands as one of the pioneers of the genre known to dance as these is a new disco the term that falls short though talking into account take into account Wang's constant revision and refinement of disco music and the exhaustive research of its roots and history along the way the de facto berliner established his renowned label ballyhoo records rush hour compiled its essential room material as a retrospective in 2009 he released on morgan guides um enrian and Environ, Environ, sorry, yeah, more guys. Of course, you should know if you're a disco with Don about him, as well as imprints like Playhouse, Ghostly, and Eskimo Recordings. Just recently, after a longer release, high hiatus, he just put out a new disco edit, just disco 12 edit sampling, um, Hugh McCaskill's 94 classic, Don't Go Lose It Baby. Daniel Wang demonstrated his expertise for record digging. Duh, duh, duh. Let's get more deals on it here. As someone who's had a, such a long history in music, how do you release and um, how do you uh, recreate the sense of naivety you had in the beginning? So it's hard to create naivety, naive, naivety uh, but I think at a certain point in your career, it is actually possible because you're back at the spot where you started. And that's how I feel. I know now that I want to say and I'm able to say it thanks to all the gadgets and friends who taught me. So even if you might not be able to recover naiv naivety, you can go back to that place of sincerity. I definitely agree with that. I think the more experience you do get, I think, like, for instance, like one little thing I've realized that I do quite often, I tend to kind of feel a record. I know its tone and it's, and it's kind of, I don't know how to call it. It's not like what Pharrell has, but this I can see a record and I can know instantly it's not right for this time. 
Like even by the day, if it's like a if it's a record that says Saturday, I'm def- I'm not gonna play on Friday, right? If it's a record that says summer, I'm not gonna play in the winter. But there's other things as well about a record that I can just feel where I can just know, okay, even though I know it's a banger, it doesn't necessarily fit with the narrative of the night, right? You kinda wanna I don't know, I kinda wanna paint a narrative, a landscape. I kinda wanna paint something that kinda goes it's like imagine I'd say it's, it'd be similar to kind of rocking up to not Hill Carnival and just banging on a techno a tech house set. It could probably do well, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't necessarily match the ambiance of what's going on around you. That's what I would probably um, kind of say, that you get over time as you're learning. That's kind of part of the naivety of learning that again and kind of feeling that, oh, wow, no, I'm kind of knowing where to go. Um, it says here, um, the question, how important is it for a DJ to know the history of music? It says here, some people tend to get stuck in the things they learn as a teenager. In Berlin, you have all these 80s and there's patch mode parties. And I guess you can say people are going, uh, they are really stuck. In the mid-90s, I stopped absorbing new music because everything sounded the same. But I didn't stop absorbing music in general. I listened to more classical music, more bosa, a lot of jazz. Today, more than ever, I consider myself a non-traditional, a non-conservative, but maybe I would call myself a pre- preser preservationist everybody knows it but maybe people wouldn't admit it that dj careers today are built on downloading new tracks and selling new stuff to no no one no one needs it's a lot like clothes which is definitely true and i think for the most part that's a kind of cheat code most djs could never really admit that you know if you're able to kind of curate a playlist of songs of new releases including and then sprinkle some demos that are unreleased um and play it you know technically well you know be proficient be proficient enough to kind of play a set out loud you'll get quite far, but you'll lose the love of playing music quite quickly because you're just essentially going through the top 100 releases of the week or the month and just buying them every single month. And just they, they, and then if you get it, it requires effort because you have to kind of put a place together. You still have to have some level of taste, but you'll lose the love for it quite quickly. The real strength, I think, in DJing, the thing that really separates the, the greats, the OKs from the greats in the world class, especially people like, I think of like a Ricardo Bell Lobos, I think of like a, you know, uh, uh, a DJ Harvey, the reason why they're world class is because they're able, you can tell they love music in general. They listen to everything. So sometimes listen to everything, you're able to kind of pluck stuff out from like 2007, 96, and a B-side of a track that came out yesterday. You're able to kind of have so many references that it doesn't even matter what genre you play because you just make it work. And I think that's really the key to it. And again, that's that's really what separates most people. But, you know, again if you want to just be successful you can just download the top 100 tracks and just keep banging it out do you, do you still do you see a significant historic reason for that matter he says that the changing point was when midi came along in 1986 before that you would only go into a recording studio if you're a really good live musician which is true with training and understanding classical or jazz you do you could you would do several takes and then you'd have the best engineers to fix and arrange it afterwards so there was a lot of knowledge and expertise needed up until 1986, especially in that gold there, which is definitely true. I guess the introduction of MIDI players is a good example of that too as well, isn't it? Uh, before that, you had to kind of burn the CD, know what to download, go and buy an MP3, blah, blah, blah. But now, essentially, you can just, you know, especially with the advent of maybe uh, torrents and stuff, you can just, like, get stuff downloaded in, you know, illegally or for free. And then you don't really need to kind of go out there and dig through stuff or go to record stores. Uh, without that knowledge, I think people are, are not qualified to call themselves DJs because they don't understand what happened in that period. If you don't understand what actually happened culturally, technologically, musically, black people, white people, all the mixing of cultures, you can't call yourself a DJ. I'm sorry. People who stick electronic music just to this 444 formula and the 303 or the mindless minimal techno stuff, you can't you can call yourself a DJ the same way McDonald's can call themselves a restaurant. <laughs> you serve music as they as they serve food. It's not good food, it's just not interesting, it has no content, it's bad for people who consume it. I percent agree with that. I think but again, I think that because electronic music or dance music got so big, there is a segment of the population out there who don't mind that. The same people that just don't mind going to McDonald's, right? They just want to go and dance to something that's that sounds right and put their hand in the air smoke in their faces and stuff boom 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 they're happy with that but there is also a segment of people who actually want to go and see a lineup that's been curated to the nth detail like you know uh production on the stage uh, uh, bespoke sound system djs who are you know spending weeks and months on their set and kind of carving a narrative through all these tunes that they're playing that aren't necessarily tunes that they made but they're creating this soundscape that kind of weaves in and takes you on all these sort of journeys and i guess it's all a different thing but i guess those people that can make the commercial stuff they're also djs as well it's just a different thing i just don't think it needs to be one thing because i don't think the stuff that i go to 
I don't think the person that goes to like an abode night would want to go to it. And they shouldn't, right? They should want to, abode can kind of serve a purpose there. Club 338 can serve an amazing purpose and they're an amazing hub and people love the stuff that they do and they, and they sell out their events and DJs go there are very successful and they have a good camaraderie and it's a great scene. But there's also a need for the stuff that I go to as well, right? People need to have that kind of, there used to be that balance, there used to be the yin, yin and yang. There used to be a, a really shiny club somewhere and a really dusty one somewhere. Yeah? Um, what do you think about sound nostalgia and people trying to reproduce a certain aesthetic? Wouldn't it be nice to make a cut and completely start from scratch with music? Interesting thought. But nobody really starts from zero. Everybody has a library in their head. And some people have more interesting libraries than others. The present is just a tiny moment, but it's always an infinite future and uh, infinite past. But it's true. Sometimes it's good to know. It's good not to know too much. Like the jazz musician in the 1930s. Some of these people were really destitute African-Americans or Irish Jewish immigrants in the US. All they had was their natural sense of rhythm and harmony. When people today try to formalize these things, they're formalizing things that happen naively because they had to find colors and textures that hadn't been there previously. Same thing with uh, Jimi Hendrix. Millions of people are trying to play like Jimi, but Hendrix was just being himself while playing a solo. 100% agree with that, man. So yeah, I reckon you can check it out. Really cool article for you to see. Again, I don't want to ramble too much on it. Uh, it's uh, an article called Electronic Beats. I'll put the whole link on the show notes. Disco Professor Daniel Wang digs into the infinite past to inform the present of DJ culture. So that's an hour in already. I'm going to end the show now because I've got to zip off and watch them United hopefully win against Burnley. Um, if you're watching this via YouTube, smash that like button, click subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of the show. If you're listening via the podcast site, please leave me a five-star review and also share this show with your friends so people can find it and all that good stuff so you can spread and get bigger and all that nice um, stuff on in between and obviously if you want to find that stuff about myself connect to me on social media definitely check out my website agostinozinger.com it'll be in the show notes agostinozinger.com you can see my my uh, twitter my instagram all the other social bits and pieces of regarding myself the days i'm going to the dj places and stuff you can see all my tour dates all my dj dates on resident advisor will be there too so definitely check that out and until then see you guys very very soon take care be safe and i'll see you on the other side peace bye